Welcome, intrepid viewers, to another episode of Roll Off a Tangent. This time we've picked on a tale by Keith Lormer from that author's Great Decade, the 1960s. The story was first published as It Could Be Anything in the January 1963 Amazing Stories. Later in the collection Nine by Lormer, it was renamed A Trip to the City. It has stylistic features which are typical Lorma, the monochrome scenes, Lorma was not one for sensuous colour, efficiently evoking ordinary or seedy settings and littered landscapes, eerie hints of larger perspectives, and the decent, perhaps slightly too trusting protagonist who persists in trying to communicate with those who just don't want to know what's going on. However, in my view, this tale would be uniquely suitable among all the author's works for dramatisation as an episode of The Twilight Zone. Brett Hale wishes to expand his horizons beyond the small town of Casperton in which he has grown up. He is determined to see the world for himself rather than rely on what he has been told in words or shown in pictures. In fact, he has just quarreled with his girlfriend because she doesn't approve of his skeptical scorn for the phony imagery in advertisements. Brett, therefore, gets on a train that leaves Casperton and soon the great mystery confronts him, starting with the way the train stops in the middle of nowhere with the track petering out in a field. From here on, it becomes apparent that Brett has the pragmatic qualities necessary for survival in an incomprehensible world. Since the railroad track has stopped, he plods onward on his own through the fields. Since the city he eventually reaches turns out to have its blocks hollowed out and its population consisting almost entirely of mindless golems who enact scenes of normal life but don't get up when you knock them over, Brett does his best to observe the pattern and character of events, taking the crazy scenario as a given. With some help from another real human being called Duva, who is scavenging in the city, Brett learns that if one interferes too much with the scenes, the gels arrive, translucent, muddy shapes that flow along the ground but can rear up and engulf a human and bear him away. Well, all right, so he does his best to bear all that in mind. A third real human being in the city is a fat man who refuses to face the truth, insisting that life is normal and the population is real. A lot of the drama centres around this refusenik character who clings so desperately to his illusion that he endangers the only other real people. After some unforgettable scenes and escapes, Brett and Duva defeat the gels by setting fire to the city via its underground fuel tanks and get away by car. Switching on the car radio, they hear a medley of voices suggesting that their action has wakened some other real people around the world. Duva finally gets round to asking what it all means. Brett, having learnt wisdom, replies, Mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just the way things are. Now, uh, that's... Uh, rough summary of the story. I haven't really done justice to Lorma's special style, which is um, the reason why it works. Uh, I would just add that I would call it, I would call it, it's a kind of realism. Um, I would call it relaxed realism. He doesn't make a big thing about descriptions. He just effortlessly uses words in such a way that one is one feels one is absolutely there and also the another anchor in reality is the character of brett hale oh. who's a really stable decent sort of guy and uh, because having all these weird things happen to a weird person would be one weirdness too many and loma doesn't make that mistake 
Right. So from left to right, how about uh, let's have Anthony's reaction. Well, this was an interesting one. This um, this gave me re re definitely reminded me of the Twilight Zone as well as you mentioned in your intro. It definitely was surreal, and you know I was immediately looking for the source of that. And if you haven't, if anyone listening or watching hasn't read the story, do yourself a favor. I think with any of our podcasts, like go read the story first because there's probably going to be spoilers, right? So, but it definitely was. I'll just uh, cut in uh, to describe what's actually happening on screen for Anthony. His, uh, okay. his video is very much delayed to our dear listeners who might be actually watching the uh, show. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. Maybe I'm not really here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, carry on, Anthony. Okay, well, as long as I, my voice is showing up or arriving when it should be, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> we'll forge on. Um, so, but, you know, this really made me feel like this was my surmise as to what was going on. And I had to figure this out before I could, like, continue reading the story once I got a few, like, few dozen pages in or whatever for, on my phone, flipping through my phone. You know, was this... To me, my guess is, and maybe this is just the strength of the story, but my guess is that we were seeing what characters in stories experience where when characters are erased or changed or edited out. Like, to me, this was sort of a, an anthropomorphific, anthropomorphification, easy for me to say, uh, of what happens during the writing process like it just all seemed like the signs were pointing that way it was you know all these characters are kind of like the side characters the the golems are all like side characters right they're the ones that are kind of just window dressing in a story the main characters are the ones that we're experiencing you know and when they're written out of a story or when the story's trashed or something they go to this they go to this gathering place. They go to this dead world where they're all sent once they're pushed out of the writer's imagination. Like that's the that's the framework. That's the mythology that kind of popped into my head as I was reading this. Because I'm like, what else is going on? Are aliens doing? Because we've read stories or we've seen stories done in shows. You know, where characters are whisked into a strange situation and it was like well aliens all took them away and put them on a strange world or something so i'm like well my brain so i got like i kind of needed to reconcile it your mileage may vary as to what's happening or actually happening but it's a sign of a great story where you can read it and people can have different interpretations as to the mystery behind it when it's not explained away but for all that i mean i thought it was brilliantly done brilliantly brilliantly written and told you know it was it also you know i'm a huge fan of the amber series the amber works of it, the amber series by roger zelazny so it's, it also gave me like roger zelazny vibes too like traveling between different worlds and kind of worlds that are amalgamations of different possibilities and different time periods and things so you had the character that was from a strange world with different words different gods different religions concepts you know that the main character meets that uh brett meets so like duval and brett were so different but they were from different stories they were from different genres of stories you know brett was from, from sort of a like a tr traditional literary story duval was from a fantasy story and then at the spoiler alert then when you at, at the end that brilliant Part where he's getting communications they're getting communications from someone on a lunar base and someone from this other area and this so it's all the different characters that were used to be main characters and stories were are all sort of kind of reaching out and trying to communicate with each other and to me the gels are the gels are just the erasing effect they're either ink or erasing or erasers like coming to like you know, erase these characters because they're they don't fit into any story anymore or they're not conforming to 
this non-story story that they're in. I don't know. It's it's I'm still grappling with what the story kind of means. Um, but yeah, and then they're dumped into like this inky pit, like which reminded me of like ink for writing or typing. Um, so it yeah, it that that fascinated me. That was like all right, I don't think anyone's ever done this, but it it definitely has shades of tunnel ton, the tunnel beneath the world story that we did recently, where it's like you know reality is something that's hollow and fragile and it's paper thin and there's another reality beneath it. Um, and you th- I, you feel like, um, you know, that's overdone. People do that all the time. You know, people, they've done it in the Matrix and other shows where it's like reality isn't what, you know, or other stories where reality is not real. What you think is reality is not real. But this was another way to do it. I, I, it felt fresh to me. It felt very satisfaction satisfactual to me i don't know um but yeah i mean it's yeah great tale you know made my imagination kind of fire and made me want to solve the mystery of it as i perceived it so yeah i thoroughly enjoyed this and i'd never read anything by this gentleman before and had never heard his name before so thank you for introducing me to his work i'll pass it on to uh, xj if you want to go next well, um, so I don't know uh, where Robert digs these uh, stories out, but um, it's amazing. It's <laughs> it's really it's really quite uh, it's it's really quite a good story. It's uh, it does have some vibes. Uh, I agree with Anthony. It does have some vibes that. Uh, that uh that are that it it has the same um taste as uh the tunnel under the world by Frederick Poe that we did a few uh weeks ago but uh it actually reminds me a lot more of the uh 1998 uh show uh, Dark City if anyone has watched that it is mm-hmm. like i managed to catch Dark City before I watched The Matrix mm. and uh, Dark City is just a much better uh, Matrix film than Matrix to be quite honest uh, to me anyway uh, anyway that aside um, in in Dark City uh, you the, the show the show had like I'm just trying to remember what I can about the show the the uh, protagonist uh, one day found out that uh, there's something really wrong with the city that they live in, and after a series of investigations, finally find find out that they had been abducted by aliens. And the final review, because what he then tried to do was uh, escape this uh, this uh, this place. What the final review is, they can't because. They are now on a ship, uh, miles and miles away from Earth, light years away from Earth, and there's no hope that they can ever return back to Earth. And the reason why this struck me was precisely the uh, ending scene towards the end, when uh, at the radio, when they started hearing like all these uh, different people calling in, and it, I got. I got the sense that it was a bit like uh, perhaps it was a little bit like being adopted, uh, abducted by aliens or some creatures of some sort, maybe the gels. And now they are all put into a zoo of some kind, a menagerie with all these different cities uh, being uh, for different people. Um, the city that Brad is in for instance, being for the fat guy. I don't think we ever got his name. Uh, and Duval having his own little space. And maybe even Brad. Uh, well, as, as as the ending of the story tried to suggest, maybe the town where Brad grew up was crafted specifically for him. And uh, I really got that uh, <laughs> really very feverish um Kind of dreamlike uh, uh, feeling towards the end of Dark City, yeah. And mm. I re- I also really uh, I rather enjoyed the 
Lomer's uh, style of writing, actually. Not so much the description, but he has a way of uh, writing uh, pacing. Like, like he would, he would, he would use very, very short sentences, sometimes uh, to the point of uh, not being complete. Excuse me, guys. My apologies, my nose was uh, getting stuffed. Um, so he would use sentences like, uh, let me see, do I have it up? Let's hope I have it up. He would use uh, things like, he would use things like he stopped and full stop and then he would then have a longer sentence a flapping window shade cast restless shadows on the steel golem features on which dust was already settling brett turned away shaking his head and and to me like sentences like that uh punctuates uh uh makes uh makes for uh faster paced reading uh, but in between his relax he like short sentences like he stopped with nothing else that speeds up pacing for me and then he relaxes the pacing with a longer sentence after that and it I, I find I find that the, I find that style of writing to be quite effective at setting like a high pace uh uh scene uh it's a it's a little bit like uh fast cuts in editing and i think it works for me anyway uh what else yeah i'm interested in to hear your both of your theories about the the story it does tempt one to make theories certainly despite the fact that of course the the point of the story is, at least from the point of view of the main character, that it's no good trying to work out what's going on. You'll never do it. But still, we can try because we're we're our own boss. We're the readers. And I I did have a my own theory about it, which was that all this might be ha might be happening in the very distant future, despite the fact that Casperton seems like an ordinary small town in the 1960s. Nevertheless, it could be that the gels, who, whatever they may be, are addicts, as it were, of particular scenarios. They like to, they, they like to observe people in scenarios. It's it's where it's how they get their thrills or or even how they recharge their minds or whatever. So um, so 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 they're moviegoers. They're fans. Sort of yes. Oh. Uh, so therefore, the fat man in um, the nameless city or uh, Duver in his own Wavly city were given oh. something to live in, and they were. They were observed, and perhaps there aren't enough people, real people around to make a real city, but you use the, the few real people that there are and surround them with golems and try and make it sound real. After all, uh, our own hobbies would, might be, seem equally incomprehensible to um, to an outsider, and perhaps the, the, the gels are, are simply enjoying their, their hobbies. I don't know, but uh, if that is the case, it, the chances of Brett and Duva find, finding it out are very slim. Uh, so the story is true to its own message in that sense, that don't bother trying to find out what's going, going on, but um, behave as decently as you can in whatever mad situation you happen to be. And... Uh, Excuse me. And although you you may not find out, be able to find out what's going on in an ultimate sense, you can 
survive by means of an instinct for sort of intermediate answers. That is to say, given the ultimate mystery, there are certain ways in which it functions and you can find out those functions. But that's, uh, that comes out in a passage on page, well, I won't say it's not page number, you're not interested in books, are you? I'll, I'll just uh, say on this page, when he's, tr uh, Brett is trying to persuade the fat man to go and help look for Duva, who's been abducted by the gels. And the fat man says, um, uh, uh, Brett says, come with me. I want to show you. It's all hollow. There's nothing behind these walls. Why doesn't somebody come along? The fat man moaned. And Brett, carrying on, trying to make his point as a Keith Lorma character tends to do uh, <clears throat> the masonry is only a quarter inch thick brett said come on i'll show you i don't like it the fat said the fat man his pace his face was pale and moist you're mad what's wrong it's so quiet and brett goes on uh, we've got to try to save him the gel took him down into this pit and the fat man says let me go the fat man whined i'm afraid can't you just let me leave my light in life in peace don't you understand? The jail took a man. They may be after you next. There's no one after me. I'm a businessman, a respectable citizen. I mind my own business, give to charity, go to church. All I want is to be left alone. And this is the point where we realise that it's possible to understand some intermediate things. Brett dropped his hands from the fat man's arms, stood looking at him. The blotched face, pale now, the damp forehead, the quivering jowls. The fat man stooped for his hat, slapped it against his, his leg, clamped it on his head. I think I understand now, said Brett. This is your place, this imitation city. Everything's faked to fit your needs, like in the hotel. Wherever you go, the scene unrolls in front of you. Now that's... Uh, that's the masterly phrase. This, wherever you go, the scene unrolls in front of you. And Brett gets to understand that sort of mechanism. It doesn't help to understand the why of it all, but it helps to uh, survive if you if you know to that extent what's going on. Yeah, and when he said you, you know, did Brett refer specifically like he thought the fat man was some sort of you know, was was the was the central focal point or you as in the royal you like, oh, you know, that's you like any of us. If we were in this situation, it's uh, it's anything. I think, but I, I think... got the sense, though, it, the fat man wasn't the central character. I, I kind of discovered that or felt that during the reading. It's just mm -hmm. like if you play along, you being anybody, the city will allow you and the gels will allow you to exist. Also, a gel is something in like in in play productions, like you put over a light to change like the color of a scene. So gels kind of like, oh yeah, gel, celluloid, something in pertaining to filming. I don't know. Like these this the whole city was like a back lot and all the other golems were like extras. So well, that's another possibility. But anyway. Well I think it's very clear that the uh, fat man is the uh, main character of that uh, nameless city. You think so? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do think so. It it does seem he uh, Loma does seem to point towards that direction. Uh and I think the gels I I think their senses are different from humans. I think they uh sense movements rather than uh 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 light or sound and so if if uh, someone is uh, still as a mouse and quiet besides, you could probably fly under the gel radar for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, or is it the fact that the fat man just plays along so well and obeys the, the arbitrary seeming rules of this reality so well that he is effectively the leader because he's... He has given in to the illusion and has accepted it and embraced it. I do believe I do believe the writer also said that at some point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so 
We're, so the, the fat the man, the fat man uh, is so uh, is so unquestioning towards others that the gels leave him alone. I I do believe there is a uh, that was um, something along those lines. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And the so uh, he's sort of like. You know, in a matrix terms, he's you know he's part of the matrix. He's he doesn't want to be unplugged from the matrix. Oh, he's he definitely does. plugged in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, go ahead, Robert. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, also the the way it's done, it's it's designed to make you wonder at how to what extent our own lives have rituals which we follow be, just because we something inhibits us from questioning them too closely like this earlier business of throwing your hat in the air wondering why people do that and how they get their hats back again and also yeah. <laughs> in the in the restaurant um as here the waiter busied himself with the cork removing it with many flourishes setting a glass before brett pouring half an inch of wine he waited expectantly brett picked up the glass tasted it it tasted like wine. He nodded. The waiter poured. Brett wondered what would have happened if he had made a face and spurned it. But it would be too risky to try. No one ever did it. That's that's true of real our real life as well. Well, I mean, yeah. if, if I if I if I drink really sour wine, you bet I'm going to make a bad face. <laughs> well, then you might put the gels on to you. Uh, <laughs> No, I I am not gonna care about that. Yeah, bad wine is bad wine. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, I think uh, I think uh, I think what's really uh, particularly uh, attractive about this story is 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 the author put just enough details, just enough clues, just enough hints. To make like a, uh, to make like a very compelling mystery uh, about uh, the whole situation that uh, Brett and finds himself in, like the town and the jails, and then the 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 things beyond the town. But he doesn't fill in the blanks and allows us to, this uh, space to wonder and speculate and. Uh, just uh, basically uh, uh, have these episodes where we are uh, we are uh, thinking about the possible uh, reasons behind all these things happening, like explaining the mystery, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's it, it's 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 meta about life, like Robert was saying about you know hey. You, that question that we always never that we never seem to bring up you know the of conformity and how we don't push back against reality and our circumstances and even the small things you know it's uh the things you don't see happen around you that are out of phase with conformity tradition and things like that and you know considering little things like the hat thing was just funny and it was discordant in the moment you know it's a person you're confused like you know Brett's confused and he's in this crowd of really bizarre people and someone throws a hat and he's like, he took that moment just to add to the confusion and ponder like, you know, what does happen? Why do people throw their hats? It's very impractical. Like, but that to me adds to like, you're in this situation where you're confusion upon confusion upon confusion and you're thinking about your brain is compensating by fixating on little things, you know, <laughs> like to, to not have to think about the big weirdness. That's all around you. So yeah, that's that's that was that that's great. That's like masterful, you know, for me. But I think uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think part of the point of the story could very well be just to make those uh, uh, observations because like right in the start of the story, it opens with a forward, uh, sort of like a forward, like a summary or or, or like a. I don't know, uh, marketing uh, uh, catchphrase or something like that. It, it says, Keith Lomer, well known for his tales of adventure and action, shows us a different side of his talent in this original, exciting and thought-provoking exploration of the meaning of 
meaning. I don't think I do think there is a little bit of um, that sort of thing going on where where it's it's not a straight up uh, uh, science fiction pew 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 story kind of. Mm. Yeah, definitely, it's definitely something that is written to provoke uh, thoughts, <coughs> or at least the author himself might have had those thoughts and he put it, uh, put pen to paper on that. Mm. Yeah, the the meaning of meaning, you know, nothing but so it's sort of nihilistic in that way. If you read the story, like the the meaning, there's mean nothing means anything. It seems like in the story, there there is no meaning. It's just you kind of have to it go could forward be and anything. It. Yes, it could be anything, right? <laughs> or it could mean it could mean anything or nothing. Yeah. You know? Hmm. Or it's both simultaneously. Yeah, but that the the idea is that there are lots of aspects of life which will be the same whether things mean anything or not. Like personal courage, loyalty, moral qualities don't don't lose their significance, which is why the 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 hero, as I say, is is such a um, a good character because. He, he also that the author doesn't spend time uh, describing the mental turmoil, which of course must exist in Brett's mind. He simply um, he 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 does give us. Um, uh, let me think. Page is quickly get to the page. Yes, uh, he does. Um, Give us some ideas, like he turned and started off at a trot, his mouth dry, his pulse thump, pulse thumping painfully in his chest. So it doesn't give his thoughts, but it, it makes you realise that he's obviously in a state, at, at, in to some extent, as as anybody would be when in this weird situation. Yeah, but, it's a great exercise in show don't tell. Yeah, you know, it's, you, he's not telling us. Oh, it's he was so confused and he was, you know, what, what is going on? He thought to himself, you know, I, you know, it wasn't this internal, you, you're not getting the, you know, the, the fourth wall broken into his emotions. You know, you're, you're not getting it in, you're not getting any thoughts externalized by him, you know? Um, so it's definitely a show, great example of show don't tell. Yeah. Except that his, his more deliberate thoughts are told, but not the, yeah, sure. not this sort of emotional, side of them so we're spared right. we're spared the sort of um i don't know uh, i don't know i don't know i don't know what it's difficult to say what i'm trying to say but i think the the narrative is well served by the fact that brett just gets on with the business of survival and uh, it increases our respect for him i think yeah for sure yeah absolutely yeah, it, it's definitely, though, I appreciate that, you know, and I think that's what XJ was saying with the pacing. That just keeps the pacing up because you're not getting bogged down in having a description of what the characters are feeling, you know, and and just to build on your point, like, you know, the, the fat man is is any conformist, right, who wants to just turn off his mind, blindly follow traditions and mores and rules of society and just kind of conform to society whereas brett you know wants to be wants to question why question everything question why we're doing things and that just seems like his nature you know um mm -hmm. and the very fact that he wanted to get out of his his podunk little town right and get away from his auntie and you know he he had that spirit to kind of just move away from his town where it seemed like maybe a lot of people didn't leave because like his relatives are in you know kind of seem like they don't want him to leave and they're very insistent upon it in the beginning. So he's just that type of person. He wants to keep moving. He wants to discover and question. So mm. he says he, he didn't just want to read about what was outside. He wanted to see it for himself. Um, right. Exactly. Really Whereas the fat man would just be content with reading the paper and never yeah. going outside the city. Yeah. 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 And I have to... I have to say, 
all of these characteristics that we're discussing about the, the two characters come out very well, come across very strongly. It's very clear what kind of characters they are, even though there is a, there is a distinct lack of uh, internal monologues. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's all, all, the better all, for it. all of it is basically shown through the acting and then the uh, the dialogue. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's all the better for it for sure. Yeah. And the dialogue when uh, Brett first uh, sits down in this uh, cafe with Duva and asks, that he finds out what Duva's attitude is. Uh, this it's very brisk brisk dialogue, but it's very neatly done that uh, Duva's worldview comes out <coughs> to be incompatible with Casperton or any other small town. It's it's like he's come from another planet, but he he doesn't. They he just mocks Brett's ideas of what the world is like, what the cosmos is like, even. And it's it's very neatly done. Um, it's not sort of too solemnly done. It, it's just, uh, uh, um, what are you talking about, Brett said? Go where in a balloon? See what? Oh, I've seen one at the tourney. Big hot air bag with a basket under it, tied down with a rope. But if you cut the rope, but you can bet the priests will never let that happen. No, sir. Uh, He's saying that uh, they wouldn't dare let the balloon go up so far that you'd hit the top of the sky. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, I, I think, that's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's really quite uh, masterly how uh, how uh, the author manages to paint the uh, outline of a completely different world just with uh, some very succinct dialogue. We we also get a sense of uh, we get even more sense of uh, where what what kind of world Duval lived in before he finds himself in Casperton. Oh no, wait, this nameless city. Yeah, yeah, uh, because uh, apparently uh, they call uh, gas. Uh, what was it? Phlogistory? What what what? Something? Yeah, something phlogiston. Yeah. Something yeah. anyway, and apparently rich people use it to cook. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's it skirts the line. You know, the, it it didn't become info dump. It didn't become two characters info dumping and describing things that we all already know. You know, or it didn't like become heavy handed in describing and in info dumping about the reality of the world or the, or the physics of the world or the you know the, the the cosmology anything like that when they when those two characters were talking and i i was i felt bad for duval when he was captured by the gels i wanted to learn more about him and they it seemed like it was kind of becoming a buddy comedy in a good way it was still, or not even not maybe a buddy drama you know if such a thing can be because it's like you know these two guys are talking and they're come from from completely different realities but they have this shared predicament so and they're trying to get along and they're not like at each other's throats you know they're 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 just like desperate to survive you know but they've become mm -hmm. and then I, I felt sad for, you know i was like no don't take his buddy away don't take duval away from you know brett because they're mm -hmm. friends now you know or they're at least survivor mates <laughs> however you want to call them then you know so i felt like upset yeah. reading the story that Duval got caught so quickly by the, the gels. Actually, you've just made me think of something, which is that uh, you know, my idea that all this is happening in the very far future, well, there may have been some sort of previous contact between the Casperton people and the, uh, the Wavly Duvas people. I don't know, but it's Duva explains to Brett um, he says about real people he says you're the first I've seen I spotted you as soon as I saw you a live man moves different than a golem you see golems do things like knitting their brows staring back in a last 
alarm, looking askance and standing arms akimbo, all these literary cliches, you see. And they have things like pursed lips and knowing glances and mirthless laughter. You know, all the things you read about that real people never do. So uh, it looks like the cliches in Wavley are the same as the cliches in Casperton, which is very interesting from the point of view of speculation as to what what this far future world, if it is a far future world, uh, yeah. what the connections might have been. Yeah, you know, and, I did. That I did. Line, I did wonder what that line was about. To be quite honest, I was like, "Hmm, this doesn't make sense." Yeah, and that line made me kind of jump into my theory of, you know, these are this is like, a, this is like an anthropomorphized anthropomorph. I'm gonna stop trying to say that. This is like a, someone trying to depict anthropomorphized. Anyway. Someone's trying to depict like like you're inside a story, like it's like sort of you're inside a story, inside a story. You know, it's you're seeing like that's you know. So all of these are side characters that you would never really dive into, or they're extras in a movie, you know, that you don't really ever delve into. Like their motivations, they're just given direction. The golems are just the extras that are given direction, and they're not more. They're no more real than that than their direction than the, what they're told to do in a story or a script, you know? So that's why they're so, that's, so that to me was a clue to like my theory, you know, of like this just being, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're inside the writing process, so to speak, in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. So, or it's a, it was like a commentary on like, on writing or, or characterization, you know, in, in fiction. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it could be anything. Yeah, it could be this anything. Title, this title is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's a meta title. This story could be anything. <laughs> like, you know, it's mm. talk, it's about, that's what the story is. It could be anything. Mm. That kind of story could have been done in a really boring way by a sufficiently avant garde writer. But fortunately, Keith Lormer is a straightforward writer who knows how to write comprehensible English um, and you know it, so therefore it's not it's it's an exciting story it's not the big yawn it, it could have been in the hands of some I mean yeah you could see you could see uh, where uh, the author's uh, action and adventure uh, roots come into play he's pretty straight to the point mm. <clears throat> yeah and you don't need convoluted storytelling you don't need non-linear jumps and storyline and things like that to to touch on large themes to to, to make people ponder you, you don't need to have all these avant-garde confusing styles of writing you know to yeah. to really get into deeper concepts mm. yeah the only the only thing out of sequence was near the beginning where Brett thinks back to his conversation on the previous day with uh, his girlfriend right. about the advertisements. And that's a fairly mild departure from linearity. Exactly. Yeah. Just a flashback. Good old flashback, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, I'm glad Robert is introducing us to some of these yeah. More obscure tales of these authors that were from the golden age, you know, sort of a fiction and science fiction, or at least on the, the back end of it. You know, maybe it's a silver age. I don't know. But this was in the 60s. So the early some of these writers, yeah, some of these stories that are like latter, you know, more not like the 30s or 40s. You know, we've been reading a lot of stuff like from, you know, Robert E. Howard and things from early 20th century. But yeah, but but this one, it, it's these authors that we don't quite know as well, but still were made an impact and had careers that were fairly thriving and you know were successful, but lesser known. Yeah, well, Keith Lormer was uh, very successful in the sixties, but then in nineteen seventy one, he had a stroke and he was never the mm -hmm. same again. He, uh, he did oh, carry, well. carry the writing, but the standard went down very sadly. One would expect that, sadly. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah. 
But yeah, mm-hmm. I uh, I don't know where you dig out all these stories, Robert, but keep them coming. Yeah, you've yeah. got this. You you like all these collections, right? Is it was in a particular collection of stories that? This was a collection of Keith Lorma stories, some of which are excellent. Um, nine by Lorma. Well, nine I mean, you you have a very good uh, library. Mm. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, probably. Got yeah, it, it makes me re- made me realize that I have a lot of like I've collected a lot of novels that I try to read and have read and still have yet to read in my collection, but not as many short story collections. So you've made me consider like maybe I need to really dive more into short stories, you know, especially as someone who's trying to write more short stories and is not I think, always trying to. Str- I think uh, I think Robert's uh, library is quite extensive, isn't it? It is not just short stories. There's also like uh, long form books that you have. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure he does, but not not probably has more short story collections than I do. Yeah. So, how many titles do you have uh, in your collection, Uh, Robert? Do you? No, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to begin counting them, but probably well over a thousand. Well, no, that's a library. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I haven't counted mine, but I mean, I have like, I have a lot, but I don't think I have a thousand, but maybe a few hundred. I mean, a thousand uh, titles could well be more than, could well be like over 2000 books. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to like maybe we'll have to show off like our we'll have to do some like yeah um, photos. Maybe maybe Robert could uh, show off his uh, library one of these days. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to show off our li- show off our home library someday. Yeah, you'd have to <laughs> pop around and uh, I'll give you a tour. Sure. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah. do we have anything else to add to this? Uh, it could be anything. Uh, I'll just no, add I... one more thing, which is that okay. um, Lorma is very good at describing litter. I mean, the the floor of the cave. Uh, which in which he finds Duva has been taken. There was a constant rustling of rats that played among the rib cages, that is to say the skeletons, sat atop crania, scutt- scuttled right behind the shin bones. Brett picked his way, stepping over imitation pearl necklaces, zircon rings, plastic buttons, hearing aids, lipsticks, compacts, corset stays, prosthetic devices, rubber heels, wrist watches, lapel watches, pocket watchers with corroded brass change. It reminds me a bit of Raymond Chandler's uh, kind of gift for describing Los Angeles in the 50s. I'm not saying that it's direct, a direct comparison, but same kind of monochrome um, detail, which is very evocative of gritty, gritty realism. Yeah but very macabre things that he's describing. Just, yeah. again, to me, where all these characters from different genres went to die when they were erased, or their yeah. stories were forgotten, or they were excised from a story. You know, sure. that, that was very... Because it was from all across different timelines, different genres. Could be. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But that was a horrific scene. I mean, that was like... I didn't... I wasn't expecting like a death pit, <laughs> you know, mm. I wasn't, that's why I, I didn't expect him to like, that's, I was like, okay, do, you know, his, his friend Duva's, Duval, Duva, Duval has been taken away to like some sort of alien chamber where we're going to find him in a pod or something. <laughs> you know, that's what I was expecting was like, okay, he's going to climb down the rope. Brett's going to climb down the rope, but then, you know, the rope gets cut by the fat man, which made me really upset. <laughs> like, and then, but then I, I thought he was going to get into like a cave or something where he found his friend in a stasis chamber or something, you know. But it wasn't. It was just a pit of skeletons of decayed people where he, where his friend had just been deposited, you know. So it was yeah. really eerie, and it really subverted my expectations. Uh, 
I know that's a loaded phrase in our world, but it did like in a good way. There's, there's subversion of expectations in a great way. So, but that was like, I was really like revulsed by that. Um, and mm. just like, oh my God, I did not expect that. Mm. Sort of again, like a tunnel under the world situation, you know, where it's like, aha, it's this is what's going on. It's, you know, it's just death in this story. It's a, it's a trash dump, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Like a body mound. Look. Mm. So, yeah. Maybe. Well, then, uh, I guess that's about that about wraps up. Uh, uh, our discussion on it could be anything. So, do we have a score ready to roll off of tongues, gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with a 10 out of 10. I think Ooh. that might be my first 10. This might be my first 10 story nice. <laughs> for this, since Good I've stuff. joined you fellows on this on this venture. But yeah, I think it's a, for me, it's a 10 out of 10. I think it's just a compact tight storytelling experience that you hope to have when you dive into reading a story and you just want a satisfying maybe not this it doesn't have to be wrapped up in a tight bow at the end or, or a clear conclusion it can leave you thinking and pondering and theorizing and that's the hallmark of great fiction of any of any genre any mode any type so yeah I, it was an enjoyable experience and I, thanks robert for bringing it to the table because uh I never would have probably read anything by Balmer uh, if you hadn't introduced me to him so in his fiction. So thank you for bringing him to my attention. Well, we could we could try another one someday. We Absolutely, could. sure. I'm I'm down. <laughs> as they said. And your and your score, Robert. What would you I'll give us? I'll astonish you by saying ten out of ten. Oh. I can't say it's the first ten oh. out. Of 10. I was sure you're gonna say it's twelve <laughs> out of ten. Mm. Yeah. It's just <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, I am going to give it an eight out of ten, uh, just because I don't uh, generally believe in giving ten out of tens. Uh, but I would highly, I will recommend this to anyone to read. Mm. And uh, yeah, dear viewers, dear listeners, please do yourself, do yourselves a favor. And read this short story. It's freely available in Project Gutenberg. So go knock yourself out. All right. Well, um, we have uh, come to the end of this particular episode. And thank you all for your attention. And if you like the podcast, please like and subscribe. And uh, comment on the video to help us out. You know, uh, it's free, free of charge. Uh, you won't lose anything by uh, writing a few uh, words here and there. And, uh, mm. well, uh, we bid you all a nice day. <laughs>